Okay, so we're going to get started today. Um, first off, you got your assignment 103 handout, but I, um, I mistakenly put on here that it was due May 7th instead of March 7th. So that was a mistake. <laughs> it's not due in, uh, in May. So um, please correct that. Okay, that was, a, that was kind of a blatant error. If I was off by a day or something, I would have let it slide. But given that that's like two months off, that's kind of a problem. So uh, change that 5 to a 3. So it should be due on 3-7, not 5-7. Um, my mistake. Sorry about that. Um, but I wanted to at least tell you all that so you didn't wonder. Uh, it would be correct on the calendar anyway. So today, we're going to talk about typography, so fonts and type and how all of that plays into your uh, design choices as a graphic designer. And so we'll talk exclusively about type today. The thought is that with last class about inspiration and um, intuition, we learn about that, then we learn about typography, and next class we'll have like a really fundamental graphic design lecture about how we lay stuff out. Um, so I like to break the typography out separate from the rest of the design lecture because it is its own entity. Uh, I have heard quotes that say 90% of web design is based on typography alone. Like, the, yeah, there's a few images, but most of what we see and what most of what we consume is type. So it's, it's relevant for us to pay attention to it and to think carefully about it. So let's talk first about typefaces with the definition of terms so that we understand what kind of an even playing field um, would be. First off, we have our styles. And some of this is intuitive. You're like, oh, I've done this before. But I want to take it a step further as I talk through it and talk about why these things are really important. But we'll start first with styles. We have a regular style, we have an italicized style, and we have a bold style. You guys have probably used all three of those fairly commonly in practice. You're using them to provide fundamental contrast or emphasis on something. This is different from that. Therefore, you use a different style to accentuate that. It's always better to choose your styles from within the font family rather than through the operating system itself. And so most of you just do the operating system way. That's the easy way of doing it. But there's a significant difference to those. So here we have an example. Uh, in each case here, we've got the, um, the operating system version. So it goes regular, italicized, bold, and then bold italics, uh, italics on the top. The bottom is the italicized version of just one set of italicized uh, font. So it looks it's reasonable. doesn't look too bad. But if I throw up there by contrast the font designer's version of each of those, you can tell immediately that they're very different. And so the idea here is that in a professional font, in a really well-designed font, the font designer thinks about these versions or these styles of the font itself. So it's not just, let me thicken up the line forms on the letters. It's actually carefully considering what does a bold version of this font look like? What does an italicized version of the font look like? And you can see differences, for example, in Hazy with the way the Z curls. It's a little bit different. If we look down here at the, the lower set of italicized uh, fonts, it's very different. Um, the serifs on the end of the fonts are a little bit different. Those kinds of things are carefully considered by the designer and therefore make the font significantly better if you're using that version of it. So usually this shows up in your font menu when you're selecting the font. You'll see like Helvetica New and then there'll be a bunch of versions of it. That's what I'm talking about. So rather than just going to Control B for bold or Control I for italics, that would get you into the standard operating system versions of the font. Weight is the relative lightness or darkness of the letter forms themselves. It's marked by changes in the line width. So the lines make up the letters. That would be called stroke in our world. That stroke thickens up. Therefore, we get heavier weight lines. We have light weights. We have medium or regular weights. And we have heavy weights, which would be bolds. So if we look at that in contrast here, we start at the very top with thin. That would be the lightest, thinnest. Um, stroke weight of text. We move our way up to extra light and then to light, regular, medium, semi-bold, bold, black, and super. So there's a big difference between super on one end and thin on the other end. And you as a designer have a choice with which versions of fonts you're going to use. 
this is actually an interesting um, case study. Uh, when Johnny Ives did the, the first uh, major iOS revision, I think it was iOS 7 when they went from the shiny buttons to the flat UI, the clock on the front of the iPhones was in a very thin, it was either in an extra light or a thin version of the font. So when you read the, the, you know, the clock on the, this part of your phone right there, when you read that, it was really hard to read because it was really thin. And a lot of the older people complained about it. They said they couldn't read it because they couldn't distinguish it from the background. Uh, and so Apple's changed it. And now rather than being in thin or extra light, it's more in a regular font. So those kinds of small design choices can make a big difference on what you're trying to show uh, or what you're trying to do with your font. Width refers to different variations within a typeface family. You could have a condensed font a little bit more text in. You could have a compressed font, which isn't quite as much as a condensed font. And then you could have an extended font. You guys have probably used the extended font in high school when you needed your paper to be three pages instead of two pages, or you had you'd written two and a half and needed a little extra, right? I'm going to show you a far better way of doing that today. So we'll, 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 get you, we'll get you up to speed so you don't have to use that font. X height refers to the height of lowercase letters without ascenders or descenders. So without the extra pieces, Essentially, the height of an X. No surprise, it's called the X height. Cap height refers to the height of a capital letter. I'm going to show you this in a graphic in just a second. So the capital letter height. And this ratio, the cap height measured from the baseline to the cap line versus the X height, which is the height of a lowercase letter, is different in different fonts. And so it's something to be aware of, especially when you're starting to pair fonts together. So let's look at it here in a little bit more um, graphic manner. So here we are. We've got our capital letter. We've got our baseline that's right here. Our cap height goes all the way up to the top of a capital letter. Our X height, on the other hand, is from the baseline to the top of a letter X. It's the same as a letter N or any of the other standard lowercase letters without ascenders or descenders. We just use an X as a good example. The descender is right here. A P, a G, a Q, those are things that hang down from your standard uh, X height. And ascenders would be things that stick up, Ds, Hs, etc. Counters are white spaces that are located in and around letter forms. They affect the legibility and readability of a given font, also the density of a font. Essentially, thin fonts at really large typefaces have open counters. They have big space in them, which can make them hard to read and or overpower those thin strokes. The opposite is true for really bold fonts. So if we have a small font that's bold, it's much, much harder to read because the counters aren't big enough. So if we look down here at errors, the smaller version of it, you can see that it's, it's much harder to read because it's bold and it's dense and there's not a lot of space around it. If we look at the upper form, there's a lot of open counters. There's a lot of big space. And by counters, I guess I should, uh, let me highlight it here. I'm talking about this space inside here, the space inside here, this space in here, this space in here. You guys get it? Same thing down below here. Um, I can't even try to color those in because they're too small. That's the space that I'm talking about. That makes it harder to read depending on the sizes. If I flip flop those, it would be easy to read both. Actually, I should do a slide where I flip-flop. Uh, the bold font being larger, it's easier to read. The thin font being smaller. Small capitals are complete sets of uppercase letters that you can use not at the capital height, but at X height. So they're shorter versions of capital letters. And they're used when large capitals would revo result in unwanted emphasis. Too much, and you guys may have tried this in a, in a paper or something, you have to use an acronym for something and suddenly it stands out. You're reading the paper, and you've got all these bold acronyms in there. It doesn't work because they're too big. And X height allows you to shrink that capital letter acronym down and making it a little bit easier to read. Lining and non-lining figures. Figures in this sense means numbers. And why they call them figures, I'm not entirely sure. But essentially, we're talking about numbers here. Lining figures are a set of numbers the same width and height as full capital letters. So you have a 1, it's the same height as a capital S. You have a 2, it's the same height as a capital S. Non-lining figures are the X height with ascenders and descenders. It makes a lot more sense when I actually show you guys 
in this version. So we have lining numerals on the left here in Futura Bold uh, and Helvetica New Bold. Those are the same height as a capital letter. The non-lining numerals or non-lining figures on the right in Garamond Pro, you see how the 3 extends down, the 6 extends up. And it's much easier as you start to look at these two paragraphs. So we're going to focus our attention on these two paragraphs for just a second. And if you read in here, you see how the $15 stands out and the 32% stands out as you're reading through. They're big in contrast. The opposite, same line of text right here, they read within the text. So they're not jumping out at you. They're smaller. They read in the context of the text. So if you're using numbers in an essay type format or in a long document format, changing to a non-lining figure can help in the readability of that particular paragraph. So they're very different in terms of how they read and how they flow across a page. Ligatures are specially designed characters when you combine two or three letters together. And the truth is that you naturally do this with, when you write. So for example, my son's name is Bennett. And when I write his name, and I, it ends in two Ts, I tend to write my two Ts and then I cross them. Right? So if I was writing his full name, naturally I would do that. Okay, same thing happens when you're, when you're working through in various choices uh, of font. Um, a T and an I, I'm trying to think of other examples. You would naturally do it. Okay, it just has to do with how you write. It makes it easier to read because you're doing it. If, however, I was typing on the computer, I would end up with a T and another T. And there's that awkward space between them because they don't connect. What ligatures do is they're designed by the font designer and they're designed to combine those kinds of things. So on the left here, we have with our ligatures off, we have FI, FFI, FFL. And you can see, when we turn the ligatures on, how those start to connect together. The F and the I, the bar comes across and connects. The Fs, the two Fs, one F gets a little bit shorter than the other. Then the bar goes all the way through, all three of them. The F, the F, and the L, the L ends up connected to the last F. So these are all things that you would do naturally when you were writing. Discretionary ligatures are more decorative. Some fonts have them, some fonts don't. You can choose to turn them on or turn them off. Uh, and you can see how they're combined together. The G going into the dot of the I, I mean, I don't, unless you are really flowy at your writing, I don't think you'd, you'd do that naturally. Um, and contextual ligatures down here at the bottom are when you have two words that actually collide a little bit, you can, or two letters that collide, you can spread them out just a little bit. So it's another specialty version of this. But essentially what it does is it automatically applies these kinds of uh, special characters when you have those letters together. So if I was typing my son's name on the computer with ligatures on, the two Ts, or if the font supported ligatures, the two Ts would automatically combine into the one character. So choosing the right font. This is probably the most important thing that you have on your plate. How many people are in 121? A lot of you right now, right? Anybody do your first poster and have Daniel say, this is awful, go do it again? Yeah? yeah. Pretty common, pretty common occurrence. How many people ha did he say, that's completely the wrong font? How dare you choose that font? Yep, happens. So you chose the wrong font. We need to choose the right font instead. So a couple things to consider. What's the longevity of the piece? How long is this thing going to be in existence? Is it trendy right now? In which case, maybe use a trendy font. Is it something that somebody's going to read 40 years from now? In which case, maybe it's not so trendy. What's the purpose of the piece? So you guys did your posters. And it was, what was your poster on? It was probably the folding planes one, something like that. It was a modernist exercise. So it would make sense to use a sans serif modernist font. Purpose of the piece matches up with uh, the, the, the font choice. Is your font innovative or is it outdated? If you're going to use something on the periphery, is this something that's, that's current? Is it trendy? Is it not? Is it traditional or too conservative? That's on the other side. Did you just pick the basic default font, Times New Roman? So Avatar comes out in 2009. Papyrus was the font. Guess what? It spread everywhere. Right? You'd be going out to dinner. And you'd see, oh, there's papyrus. Right? You see little things in home goods or whatever. They're all in papyrus. It became really trendy. 
Now you look at papyrus and you're like, ooh, that was so 2009. These are things that you need to be aware of with font choice, is they can end up being outdated. Compare your font side by side for your desired readability. Is it evoking the right emotion? Is it legible? Does it reflect the needs of your client and your viewer? We talked about that in the past. Your client and your viewer, does it reflect those needs? Is it appropriate? So here's an example. I found this one, uh, and I thought it was pretty good. So the left example, um, this is uh, a, out of A Tale of Two Cities. They're quoting a piece. The left example is your Times New Roman, your classic uh, font out of the computer, which hopefully I'll convince you today to never use that because there are better choices out there. And it's essentially the same as the quote on the right. The quote on the right, however, is a different font, Bakersville, which was designed in the same country and in the, around the same time as this book being written. Which one's the better choice? The right one. Right? It's a little bit more appropriate. They're very close. They're very similar. If you read them, they, they read the same. So the legibility, the readability, all of that is the same. But one is a little bit more appropriate than the other. So you as a designer have this choice. You can make those kinds of decisions. Another example here of two different pieces. It's the same text, looking at fonts side by side. The left side is a sans serif font, for the most part. Eh, it's kind of a hybrid. The right is a serif font. One's a little bit easier to read than the other. And so you want to think about what is appropriate, what is not appropriate. I like this one, just the graphic is fun. The periodic table of typefaces um, working their way down into the, the old English fonts. It's just kind of a fun way of looking at it. I had to throw a few of these graphics up there. This one is particularly fun, too. Um, I had, I had not seen this, and I, you know, I wrote the, the book for the class. And so I think, I think it's kind of funny, because you start here, essentially, and you follow these little lines. So I'll go up, and yes, I'm going to start with a book, for example. Are you completely in doubt? No, I'm not in doubt. I kind of know where I'm going. So I go through no. Then I continue on. A champion of usability, perhaps. No, probably not. Keep going. Everybody loves Garamond? No, I don't love Garamond. That's what my wife always used for her resume. I'm over it. Okay, then we continue on here to this one. So you want a sans serif, is that right? Yes, I do. Woot, Optima. Guess what? That's the choice that I actually chose for the book. I hadn't seen this. I didn't use it. But it's kind of amusing that it worked out that way. So you can do the same thing. If you're completely in doubt and you don't know what font to choose, try something like this. Work your way through. It's not perfect, but it's not a bad idea. And some of it's kind of funny. Like there's one reference in here to Terminator. And you know, whatever, it's kind of fun. Terminator's probably like, you guys are, what is that? Yeah, that was a movie in the 80s when I was a kid. <laughs> serif and sans serif. I've made references to these before. Let's talk about what they are and what they do. A serif font has these little tails on the end of the font. And so you see it highlighted right here at the bottom, right there. You see those little tails that extend out. It's not how we actually write, certainly. But what it does is it makes it much easier to read in printed form. So if you pick up um, a, a magazine or something, chances are it's going to be in a serif font. And it's going to be in that serif font to make it easy for you to read. Sans serif, on the other hand, don't have these little uh, extra little serifs that extend out. So you see the bottom of this one, for example, is just a straight end. The, the, the S doesn't have anything on the two ends like that. Um, sans meaning without serif. So this is a sans serif font. Um, this has become very common online. And in all honesty, I'm not quite sure why websites have all gravitated toward this. I think it's kind of a modernist aesthetic that people are doing. Um, it's still a little bit harder to read. The thing about being online is you'll notice that, that websites typically use fonts that are a little bit larger. So we're not concerned with cramming a bunch of information in a small space. So for example, pick up your, your magazine that you read on a regular basis. They try to fit as much onto a small number of pages as possible because they don't want to have the magazine cost more. They make more money the fewer pages it is. The more the content they can fit on the fewer pages, the better it is. So they can make the font smaller if they're a serif font. Web, we don't have any restriction on page size or how long an article can be. So the fonts can actually be a little bit bigger, in which case a sans serif is relatively readable. So on the left, 
we have a sans serif. On the right, we have a serif font. And as you look at these, they're different. The boldness of the one on the left makes it a little bit easier to read. But the, the serif on the right is faster to read, especially if it was smaller. Combining typefaces. So if you're trying to use, if you're trying to create a hierarchy within your graphic design, you may find the need to combine two typefaces together. And first off, you don't generally have to combine two typefaces. You can just use variants or styles within one font family. That's the, that's the easiest, best case. Everything's going to go together nicely. The font designer already co considered it and thought about it. So you can stick within that same family. If you want to combine multiple typefaces together, you just have to be careful about how you choose to do it. So here's an all in the family example. This is all the same uh, font. We've got a bold version, and we've got a standard uh, regular version combined together. We get accent for the top. The headline is a little bit bolder. And then we have the body text as well. If we're going to combine typefaces, though, we don't want to combine two serif faces or two sans serif faces. In rare instances, it works, but for the most part, it won't work. So we don't want like kinds. We want different kinds. So if you combine a serif and a sans serif, that works well. But we can take it a step further. We want to make sure that they have similar x heights and similar letter widths so they work well together. And the truth is, if you want to combine two fonts together and you don't know which fonts to pick, do a Google search for it. Because there's lots of examples of combinations that work well. So here's a couple examples. The, the left side is the sans serif font. The right side is the serif font. And you can see that the letters are similarly proportioned. The x heights are the same. And the overall um, widths of individual characters are the same. Does that kind of make sense? Remember, you can, of course, use display fonts, script fonts for titles, headings, subheadings. That kind of stuff can work. You just wouldn't want to use it for the body of your text. That wouldn't work. So let's talk about designing with type. So there's two things here. There's legibility and there's readability. And on the surface level, the two things seem the same. But they're actually different. So they're, they are, they are for the same purpose, however. Uh, that is essential communication or successful communication. Legibility is the recognition of individual letter forms and their relative position to other letters. So it's the letters themselves. Readability is how the typography is presented as a whole in lines or paragraphs that allow you to read the type. Does that make sense? So legibility, how do I read the individual letters? Readability, how do I read the paragraph? That's the easiest way to think of it. So here we go. Legibility example. Arial's pretty easy to read. Mesquite poses a bit of a challenge, doesn't it? So if you were thinking about uh, writing your English paper and you turned it in in this, I don't think your English professor would be very happy. So that's individual letter forms. Readability, we've got a nice um, serif font here. It's very readable. We could see that in a paragraph. It would work out nicely. Letter Gothic on the right, however, is much harder to read because it doesn't have those serifs. Though the truth is you could read either one at this size. They're both big enough. Impact, this bold here, that works nice for a headline to draw your attention. But if you wrote your whole English paper in that, again, you'd probably get it kicked back to you saying, this is not going to work. The other thing that is important is this idea of context. When do you choose to use a particular font? And some of you got hit with this already with Daniel's kickback of your first poster because you picked the wrong font because of the wrong context. So in this example, they talk about, I'm writing financial, uh, some kind of financial information. It would feel more appropriate in Times New Roman or a serif font than it would in Comic Sans. So let's say you were writing a really serious document for your, your board of invest, you, you've got, you're, you're sending it out to your investors in this big project or whatever it is, and you wrote the whole thing in Comic Sans. Would they take it seriously? Probably not. So your choice as a designer makes a big difference here. Objective representation. 
This is the practical, straightforward way of ordering your text or thinking about text. It's clear, ordered presentation of information, clear hierarchy. Subjective, this is the more chaotic objective, or subjective, sorry, uh, interpretive way. It's focused on how the letters um, work together to create this overall composition. And we'll talk this, about this a little bit more as we get further along. Macro perspectives. What does the overall design look like? How does the type fit into that overall design? What's the format of the composition? Those kind of big picture ideas. This is where your typographic hierarchy. The headlines all look like this. The bodies all look like this. The little quotes look like this. It's that big picture stuff. The micro perspectives are the small details, like the kerning, spacing, ragging, tracking, which we'll talk all about uh, extensively in a little bit. They ensure the clean presentation and a consistent application of your fonts. So something like this, I can't even read it, but it's really well done from a typographic standpoint. Symmetry and asymmetry. Symmetrical is balance and harmony. Asymmetrical is activity and motion. So how do you lay out the text on a page? And again, we'll get into lots of this layout strategy next class, but I like to preview it a little bit, get you thinking about it. Alignment. The horizontal and vertical position of the typography within the margins. The alignment creates the visual relationships between various bodies of text and or images, text to image, etc. Typographic color refers to the relative density of a set of paragraphs. So as you squint and look at this, you can see that some pieces, some text in that composition stand out. They're darker than other text. It's not because that particular text has more words. It's about the type that's chosen, how much space is around the type, and how dark does it appear. So this block of text actually acts as an element on your page. If you think about your overall composition, you've got blocks of text, you've got images. How do they work together? Don't forget to step back and kind of squint at this to determine that relative lightness or darkness and how does that fit into your overall design. Type size is measured in points. Changes in type size often result in a nice hierarchy. You could have a, a, a heading that's at 14 point, a subheading that's at 12 point, and a body text that's at 10 point. Just variance in size as your hierarchy. The best thing to do would be to develop a proportionate set of sizes and be consistent with it. My headings are going to be 14 point, my subheadings are going to be 12 point, and my body's going to be 10 point, and it's consistent throughout. This is not the way that you make your English paper a little bit longer. Right? You don't go from 12 point to 13 point. They know that trick, believe it or not. Lowercase letters are more readable than uppercase letters. So let's think for just a second about architects. How do we write on, on plans? We write in all capital letters. So what capital letters do is it makes you concentrate as you start to read this. So we believe that our stuff is really important and that you, builder, or you, designer, or you, client, need to read what we have to say. Therefore, we're going to write in all capitals and make you work to read our, our text. So it emphasizes letter-to-letter -letter recognition, which slows down the reading process and forces you, hopefully, to understand what we're trying to say. Lowercase letters, far more readable. So let's show an example. So for example, it doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word appear. This is hard. You can do it, but it's hard. You have to concentrate, right? Try this. For example, it doesn't matter in what order the letters in the word appear. The only important thing is that the first and last letter are in the right place. The rest can be a total mess, and you can still read it without a problem. Pretty wild, huh? So this is the same paragraph in lowercase letters, and our brains are really good at figuring this out, where reading this is a whole lot harder. You really have to think. Kerning. Kerning adjusts the space between individual letters. It's used to correct letter collisions and or unwanted spaces. Uh, it allows the text to flow and read smoothly. There's a few things that always happen. And this is, again, one of those examples where you would naturally do it if you were writing by hand. So type here, the T and the Y. In computer terms, 
right? Computers say, oh, let me write the T first, and then there's a space, and then I'll write the Y here. And then there's a space, and then I'll put the P. In, if we correct that, however, or if we were writing it by hand, you would write the T, and then the Y would go underneath the top of the T. It's just natural to write it that way. So using kerning, we can actually take the Y and move it over underneath that T the way it would be appropriate. So things that, that typically happen, T's, F's, V's, Y's, those kinds of things. L's usually end up with too much space between them, or 1's, depending whether they're two L's or two 1's. Uh, 19, for example, a 1 and a 9, there's a little extra space. So we can correct that with kerning. And I'll show you how to do it in InDesign uh, a little bit later today during the demo part. Tracking, on the other hand, adjusts the spacing between words, lines, and paragraphs. So remember way back I told you that I was going to tell you how to make your English paper a little bit longer? There's your ticket. So instead of just making the font bigger, or instead of con switching to that extended font, you adjust the tracking, and suddenly your paper can get longer really easy, and it doesn't look different. It might get a little lighter from a typographic color standpoint, but essentially it just spreads everything out just a little bit. So I'll show you how to do that in a little bit. I just had to make today's class valuable somehow, right? It also influences typographic color, which I just said. Leading is the space between lines of text, and it's measured from one baseline to the next. So if you're working in Microsoft Word, they have like double space or, or those kinds of, of settings. That's an easier way of understanding what leading is. But leading, or, or when we say double space, it says take the, the point size of the font, double it, and make that the space between my lines, so between baselines. So that's why you end up with a whole extra line in between. Typically, we don't have leading that's that, that high. I think the default is like 1.2 or 1.4 uh, times your, your standard text. So tall X heights or heavy typefaces, sans serifs need more leading and shorter, wider, uh, I can't even talk anymore. Basically, sans serifs, you need more space between the lines. If you have a serif font with those little tails, you can compress it, you can get more text into a smaller space. I think this is really good from a typographic standpoint. Uh, this is a portfolio of, of work, an architectural portfolio. You guys ultimately will be creating a portfolio in this class, so I like to throw a th few of these images at you. But look at how carefully the fonts have been considered. I believe this is all within one font family, but it's still very well thought out and very well uh, controlled. And it works nice with the overall design of the book. Another example here. This one turns out a little bit blurry. Quote in all caps emphasizes letter to letter recognition, slower to read, concentrate on that particular piece. OK, so we're going to switch over and we're going to start on our uh, exercise 110. Let's take about a 10 minute break. We'll come back at 9 and we'll start in with InDesign. OK? OK, so we're going to go through uh, exercise 110. And the big thing uh, that I want to emphasize in this part of it is really understanding type and how InDesign deals with type. And it's very, very good at, at, at managing type. So I'm going to go ahead and create a brand new document. So I, I left it with the splash screen just as if I hadn't opened anything so you guys can see me do it all the way through. Some of the parts that I'll deal with today will repeat the same things that we did last class, so you get uh, some repetition here as well, though we'll be dealing primarily with type, uh, obviously. So I'm going to create a brand new document by clicking on the Create New Document button here. This intent is for print. I'm going to uncheck Facing Pages, and I'm going to leave my page size at Letter. The margins, top and bottom, I'm going to go ahead and leave them in place where they are. The truth is they're arbitrary, and I can also edit them after the fact if I want to. Um, so all of that is fine. I'm not going to worry about anything else um, or any of the more options. I'm just going to go ahead and say OK at this point. 
and I now will have my 8.5 by 11 document. So like last time we had the square, this time it's just a regular letter size piece of paper. And now it's time to start working through our various elements. So first off, I want to right click and change my units so that they're in inches. So I'll right click where the two rulers join and go to inches. That just makes it a little bit easier for me to understand or, or for me to read. If you feel more comfortable working in centimeters, um, you could do that too, or in millimeters, I guess. Uh, so it's a matter of comfort. For me, I'm going to be in inches as we go forward. So I have my page set up, but now I need the other pieces. So last class, we went and we found images, and we placed those images into frames. You guys remember that, right? We can do the same thing with a text document rather than an image document, and we can place it into text frames, essentially. So we're going to use the same strategy that we used last class, uh, only this time we're going to work with text. So I'm asking you for the first part in part one to work with a uh, predetermined page of text. That predetermined page of text is available in today's exercise. So I went ahead and went to exercises spring 2018, and I've clicked today's exercise uh, 110. At the bottom here, you'll see Vitruvius's 10 books on architecture, chapter 1. It's a Word document. So you guys should be familiar with Word documents. I'm sure you've, you've typed a fair number of papers in Word documents. That's all that I'm looking for is that Word file. You guys can go ahead and download that file. I already have it on my flash drive, so I'm going to download it right now. But then I can jump back to InDesign. So you have the Word document that's saved. And you guys should be thinking about, oh, OK, well, I, I do when I write my history paper or my English paper. I tend to write it in Word. I can then use that document in an InDesign. Remember, InDesign is all about formatting your document. So now that I'm in uh, InDesign, I can go ahead and create a text box. So I'm going to come over on the left side here and pick the T tool for text. <coughs> Sorry, sneeze. Um, I'm going to pick the T tool for text, and I'm going to go ahead and draw in a large box for text. And I'm going to edit that box a little bit later on. I drew it the same size as my margins. It doesn't have to be. It just happens to be what I drew it in. Now, instead of actually going in and, and typing right now, I'm going to go ahead and go up to the File menu and choose Place. And with Place selected, I'm going to go find that Vitruvius text that I downloaded. There it is, Chapter 1. That's the one I gave you. You can find it online. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great book on, uh, on basically on architecture. I'm going to go ahead and put this into my document. So I'll go ahead and say open. And it's going to drop in the start of this book or the start of the chapter. Now it pops up this missing fonts. And it says, oh, I'm missing a particular font. Would you like to substitute a font? So there's two fonts that are missing, Times Roman Regular and Times Roman Bold. The reason they're missing is probably because I opened it on my Mac and they have different fonts than what's on the Windows. But anyway, this is something that happens. When this happens, the text is highlighted in this pink, saying, well, it's hard for you guys to see it. When you guys do it on your computer, you'll see it, saying something's wrong. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Find Font. And Times Roman and Times Roman Bold, I need to fix those two. So I'm going to click on Times Roman first. Replace with font family, I'm going to pick Times Roman. I think on Windows it's called Times New Roman. There it is. And the font style is going to be regular. Change all. Times Roman bold needs to be Times New Roman bold. Change all. And I'll click done. Notice that my text doesn't, isn't highlighted anymore. So there's not a problem with the font. And I can go ahead and say done. This, this top here is a link. And that's why it's blue. We're going to deal with that in just a second. So essentially, I now have my Word document. And I've dropped that Word document into an InDesign file, such that the text now flows through my document. The text that I have is much longer than the, the one page that I'm working on today. You're only doing one page. We could, we could continue this onto multiple pages. But for right now, we're not. But I can tell that it's longer because there's a little red box in this lower corner with a plus sign in it. That means that there is more text beyond what's 
contained within this one frame. For our purposes, it doesn't matter. I don't have to get to the end of it. So the nice thing is once I have the text in this box, I can actually choose to change the, the, the width, for example, of my column. So let's say uh, I wanted there to be two columns on the page. I can put this text in. Notice that it automatically resizes everything for me. I can go to the text tool, and I can draw another text box right here, like that. And rather than placing text in this one, I'm actually going to use my black arrow. I'm going to click the little plus sign down here at the bottom. When I click that plus sign, see I get a little preview of text, and I get a little chain icon. What that does is it allows me to chain this body of text into the next frame. So now if I click into the next frame, it will continue the text into this frame. If I were to resize this document, let's say I pulled this over a little bit more. Well, that didn't change much. Let me pull this up shorter. The text automatically adjusts. So what I've, where it ends here would start back up here. So as I manipulate these boxes, I have complete flexibility because they're continuous. So I'm not copying one section into different text boxes and trying to keep them continuous. It is one continuous body of text, and we'll flow through those. Yeah. If you were to do it again, how would you redefine it? Yep. Yep. I'm going to end up doing another one here in a second. So let's say that this was like this. Actually, let's make, let's make a third column. Why not? This might end up getting a little bit tight. but. OK, so I have one column, two columns. I want a third column. I'm going to go into the text tool, create another text box like that. Now I want this text to flow through into the third column. So I'll go back to my black arrow, and I'm going to click on that little plus icon, that red plus icon at the bottom of the last text box. When I click on it, it will load up, give me a preview of the text and a little chain icon. I can then continue the text in that text box. So I could keep doing this. I could go on to multiple pages, and I could continue chaining all the way through my document. If I updated my Word file, I could go back and replace it, and it would still flow all the way through my, my document, which is nice. So once these boxes are chained together, they're infinitely chained together. They will stay that way. So now it comes to starting to think about the formatting of the text. And as I brought it in, you guys noticed that I had to, uh, I had to adjust the fonts because I didn't have the right fonts or whatever. But I can, of course, change the fonts um, as, as I'd like. So first off, I'm still in the Essentials workspace. It would be a lot easier if I switched out of the Essentials workspace and moved into the Typography workspace because that has all our type tools. So I'm going to jump down to Typography from my workspace. And you'll see that it added a few more windows down here. I have a paragraph window, and I have a character window. So the character formats have to do with individual characters. So one particular uh, letter I can adjust. So for example, here in chapter 1, if I took the C, I could then adjust the font. I could adjust the size. I could adjust the. Um, kerning, remember tracking is paragraphs, so that's, that's a bit bigger. Uh, let, me, let me start to show a few of these as an example. Now I would also like to add that what I'm doing right now is showing you examples. It's not necessarily going to make this look the most attractive. So this is not about making it attractive. I'm trying to, to show you what these various options are. So let's look in here, and I'll take this first C. I'm going to go to my character. Let me close the Align Tools. Let me just stick it over here for a second. There we go. So first off, I can change the font. So if I didn't like this text, I could select it. And I could say, you know what? I don't like Times New Roman. Instead, I want to pick something else. Let's pick, uh, there we go, something totally different. So now I have this selected. I can also make some other adjustments. 
So remember, let's see if there's anything that's, I need this to be bolder for you guys so you can see it better. Okay, that's a little bit bolder. Okay, so for example, the difference between the P and the T, the spacing there is a little bit off. I could adjust the kerning, which is right here, to make those two letters closer. So it's subtle. But now those two are a little bit closer. I could take the P and the A, and I can make them a little bit further apart. And as I work through this, I could adjust those letters such that they feel like they're appropriate. So those were small, subtle adjustments, but it's certainly something that you can do on an individual letter-by-letter -letter basis. As we come in here, we have this option, which is a, uh, a superscript. So essentially, I could take one of my letters here, and I could make that letter Oh, come on. Of course it doesn't want to do it, right? Oh, sorry. Superscript is down here. There it is. And I could raise that one letter up, should I want to. I'm not going to. I'm going to keep it down. Let's see. What else do we have here? We'll get, deal with tracking in just a second. If I wanted uh, the, the height of a letter to get taller, I could adjust the height of an individual letter and make it taller. If I wanted the width of a letter to get bigger, I could adjust the width of the letter and make it bigger. So I have individual character uh, adjustments. I could italicize by just slanting the letter over at, say, 30 degrees. So I have various options that are character-based. So it's the individual characters that I'm adjusting. I also have options for paragraphs. So let's come down to the next set here. This is the paragraph window. And let's look at this first paragraph. Now the thing about a paragraph adjustment is it's going to apply to the paragraph that my cursor is in. So my cursor is currently in this paragraph. Therefore, I can start making paragraph adjustments. So here, we have first off our justification. So I could center justify the paragraph. I could right justify the paragraph. Or I could left justify the paragraph. I could also um, make it such that the edge was not ragged anymore, which spaces out the words in between. That's an option. Uh, I could do that centered, or I could do that uh, to the right, though you're not seeing much difference right now. I could also take this uh, particular paragraph, and I could add space before or after the paragraph. So if I wanted space before the paragraph, I could increase the space. It's going to give me more space before the top of the paragraph. If I wanted space after the paragraph, I could add space after the paragraph. Oops. There we go. It's adding space after the paragraph. Now, I also have the ability, for example, to add something called a drop cap. And a drop cap takes the first character, in this case the number 1, and makes it bigger by a certain number of lines. So we'll start here. And I'll say, right now it's at 0. I want it to be at, there's 2, there's 3. See how it's taking up a certain number of lines of text? This is kind of like the old English book where the first letter is big of a particular line of text. We can do that. I can control the number of characters. So for example, the period's really awkward here. I could say, you know what, I want that to go so that I get the 1 and the period before it starts. And this, once again, controls the number of lines of text. There's two, there's one. And we could keep getting bigger with the number of lines of text. So let me go back down. There is an option here to hyphenate, which would hyphenate and keep the edge a little bit more consistent, should you want to. Um, and that's about it for our paragraph styles. So we, we're able to adjust particular uh, characters. We were able to adjust paragraphs. But it would be rather daunting to go in and have to adjust each paragraph separately. So let's say I wanted this same uh, drop cap to show up on each subsequent paragraph. It's a lot of work to go in and, and manually adjust it for each one. So we enter something called paragraph and character styles. So previously, I showed you the paragraph window and the character window. We also have paragraph styles and character styles. And essentially what these do is it allows you to set up a particular format 
and then reuse it in various pieces in your document. So you could, for example, set up something for a heading. So right now, let's say that I took the, the education of the architect. I wanted that to be set up as a particular character style for the heading. So let me go in and choose character. I'm going to get it to look the way I want it to first, and then I'll create the character style. So let's say that let's say I wanted that in Arial, for example. And I want it to be a little bit smaller. Yeah, we'll do that. And let's see, what else? Yeah, that's about it. So I wanted that particular font and that particular size. When I'm done, I'm going to go ahead and choose character styles. And right now it says none. If I click on the new character style, it will inherit what I just did to this text. So this character style one is now that text. Let me rename it, and I'll call this heading. And I'll say OK. Now at any other point in my, in my paragraphs, I don't have another heading. But let's say that this first little bit here was a heading. If I click on heading, it will change the font to be the heading font. If I took this piece and I applied the heading font, it would change and be the heading font. <coughs> this. I overrode that R. It's going to kill me here. Sorry, I had caps lock on. There we go. So that inherits this particular heading style. Now the neat thing here is if I wanted to adjust, like, oh, I really don't like Arial as my font, I could go back in, I could double click on this heading style, and I could make changes. So here's under my basic character formats. You know what? I really didn't want Arial anymore. I wanted Garamond. When I say OK, everywhere that I've used it with that particular style will then update. So you can see how this is powerful to make changes later on if you're careful when you do it. So I can do the same thing with a paragraph style. So I have this paragraph already set up. I have the drop cap the way I want it. I have the font the way I want it, et cetera. I'll take this particular piece. I'll go to paragraph styles, and I'll create a new paragraph style. There it is, paragraph style one. We'll call this drop cap. And now all I have to do is put my cursor in the other paragraphs. So we'll put it in three, select drop cap one, and suddenly it matches exactly what this paragraph was. We'll go into two and do drop cap, we'll go into four and do drop cap, and now that's the same for all of them. Does that make sense? I could do a character style for these numbers. Let's say that I wanted something else for the numbers. Something like that. I don't know. I'm picking this stuff at random. Like I said, it's not about making it look good. It's about showing you these various things. So let's say I like that. I could come into my character styles. I could create a new character style. This one is going to be called uh, number drop cap number. There it is. And now I could select my other numbers and apply that same style to it. And like I said, at that point, you can always go back and edit. So I can double click. I can go into my character formats and say, you know what? I didn't like that particular font. Let me change it and say, OK, I have no idea what that one's going to look like. You get the idea. So you can make those changes afterward. It's a really good strategy uh, for being able to do a lot of specialty type. So if, for example, you were setting up a hierarchy on your lecture series poster, you would want to set up a character style and a paragraph style for each of those special hierarchy setups. So what's a heading? What's a subheading? Uh, what's the body text? Such that any of those entities you could easily apply to your document. Okay. So that's character styles and paragraph styles. Just like with character styles, you could go in and you could adjust. So if I didn't like the drop cap here, I could come down to drop caps and nested styles on my drop cap. 
and say, you know what, I really wanted it to be three, again, the two characters, and now it adjusts for all of it. So it's a really powerful way of working with your tools. So let's say that I wanted to put an image into this, for example. I'll go to the frame tool, which we did last class. So I'll click on the frame tool, and I'll go ahead and I'll drop a frame for where I wanted my image to be. So let's say that's where I wanted my image to be. And I might end up moving it or adjusting it later. With that frame selected, I can go to File and then Place, and I can drop in an image. I don't know if I have an image. I'll use one from last class, like that. Remember, I can right click, and I can go to Fitting, and I can say Fill Frame Proportionally. There it is. I don't know what this has to do with Vitruvius, but whatever. You get the idea. Now, this image is on top of my text. So I could use my black arrow and right click and say, um, arrange, send to back. And then my text is on top of it. It still doesn't quite look right. I could, of course, take my, my paragraph here, and I could shorten it so that it wasn't on top of it. But I don't want to have to do that. What InDesign does really well is it allows you to take the image, and we can come over here to our text wrap window. And text wrap allows you to say, you know what? Don't let the text overlap my image. Go around my image. And there's a couple various styles. There's go over the top of my image. There's go around my image. Go tight around my image. Break all text adjacent to my image. Or break the text and go on to the next page afterward. So generally, it's this second option over here. And the nice thing about this is you can then go back, take your image, and you can move it wherever you want to move it. And it will, whoops, it will work the text around wherever your image is. Anybody ever try to do this in Word? It's awful trying to do it. Let alone try to put two images on one page. Oh, forget it. it doesn't work. Okay. So in InDesign, it's really easy to do this, and it's really easy to wrap your text around your words. As I resize, so if I came in here and I went to my free transform tool to resize this image, sorry, I have to select the image first. There it is. Free transform. If I made this image bigger, it would still wrap around that image. So it's always going to work to wrap around your image, um, regardless of where you have it uh, on the page, which is really important. Remember, if this image looks a little bit blurry, that's OK. It's a referenced file. I can always right click and go to display performance and show uh, high quality display to see the full resolution version of it. Go back to my display performance here. And I'll go back. Oops, fast display gives us just the rectangle. I didn't want that. Typical. There we go. So, what I want you to work on in part one is getting this figured out. Sort out your, your character styles, sort out your paragraph styles, experiment with the various options, get yourself comfortable with type in InDesign. You'll go ahead and you'll save this uh, as a JPEG, just like you did last class. So you go to File and then Export when you're done. You get into the correct folder here. Save as type will be JPEG. I'll click Save. At this page, a few of you made, made a mistake here last class, and you ended up with two small, blurry uh, images. You'll want to make sure that your, uh, we only have one page, so that's fine. Quality is set to maximum, and your resolution is set to 300. So you want those two pieces to be set correctly. And then you go ahead and click on Export, and it'll write the JPEG image of your, of your file. When you're done with that, uh, I want to have you guys explore loading in alternate fonts. And I want to show you guys how to do that. Um, these computers won't allow you, because they're lab computers and they're locked, you can't choose to load your own font on them without an admin password or whatever, so we have to do a little bit of a workaround. If you have your own laptop or you work at home, don't be afraid to load new fonts. A lot of times you can get really nice fonts uh, for free online that are open source. A um, couple example websites would be Font Squirrel. If I could spell Font Squirrel, there it is. And of course, it won't load. 
Google Fonts is also pretty good. There we go. They have a bunch of fonts that are available. So you can look through and you can find fonts that you like. So for example, let's say that I liked this particular font. I can click on it. And it takes me to this uh, website. It's, it's a free. Sometimes you have to like pretend to buy it or say it's zero or something like that. Um, anyway, you can, you can download these fonts, some of which, of course, everything is so slow today for me. OK, so let's, let's try this one. The idea of Google Fonts is that uh, you can choose to use these on an online uh, document. You can load it into your CSS style sheet. But I believe that you can also download them. I just don't do this all the, all the time. I don't know, I have to look up how you get them. Oh, there it is. There's the download link. Download, there you go. OK, so there's the font. I got it from Google Fonts. Uh, font Squirrel does have good fonts. You can see that they're good. It just wasn't loading fast enough for me. So I'm going to do this other one as an example. Uh, so I went ahead and I downloaded that one. It's right here. I'm going to show it so that I can see it. Uh, there it is. It went as a compressed file into uh, the downloads folder. I'm going to right click and say extract all. And I'm going to put it on my flash drive or in my OneDrive so that I have access to it. I have a folder called Resources that has a lot of different things in it. One folder in it is called Fonts. These are all the fonts that I've used in the past. And I'm going to put this into that Fonts folder. Let me go ahead and extract that. Uh, and it's extracting to right there, I believe. There it is. Perfect. So I want to go ahead and I want to load that font. Like I said, it won't load naturally on the computer. So we're going to use a different strategy for doing it. And I have a tutorial written out for you. Um, it's under uh, Tutorials, Digital Life, and it's 0 0.15, the AMP font viewer. It's right here. It's a portable application that runs off your flash drive. So it doesn't need to be installed on the computer, but will allow you to temporarily install and use a font. Um, so you can go ahead and go to this website. There it is. With these kinds of um, websites, you always have to be careful because there's lots of ads. Like if I click this button, for example, it'll go to an ad. Uh, I want to download it from this link right here. And I'll pick the, uh, the Softpedia download link, and it should pop up. Yeah, here it is coming. <coughs> there it is. It's downloading. It'll download a zip file. When that one's done, I'm going to show that one in its folder. There it is. I'll right click on it and say extract all. And I'm going to put this one, just like I did in the last one, into my resources folder. But this time, I have an application folder called portable applications which is, I already have it installed, so I'm not going to reinstall it. But I have AMP Font Viewer there, and it'll load it there. I know this is a bit of a bunch of hoops to jump through, but on the lab computers, it's kind of our only option. So let me go into my flash drive. Once it's extracted there, if you go into that Applications folder, there it is. It's called Font Viewer. I'll double click it, and it will open up. There it is. I want to go to the Not Installed Fonts tab. And again, all of this is written out in the tutorial. So if you need to do it, you can go there. And I have mine on my OneDrive. I have to find my drive. And it was in Resources. And then it was in Fonts. And it was the Fat Face Regular. This is it. So once I found it, I'm going to install the font temporarily. So I'll click on this button to install font temporarily. Yes, I want to install it temporarily. Perfect. So it's installed it temporarily without any admin passwords or anything like that. Now that it's there, 
I need to go back to InDesign and see if I can install it or see if I can use it yet. Sometimes you have to restart InDesign. So let me come back to my character styles. I'm going to say, I'm going to change my heading style. And I'm going to change my font here. And it was, yep, there it is. It loaded. So now I have that loaded. I'll say OK. And now it's changed and used that particular font. So it's a way of getting other fonts. So if you don't like the fonts that are on the computer, you can use it. If you have a font on your home computer that you want to use, you can get it and drop it into the school computer to use there. So I know it's a lot of workarounds, but I at least wanted to present you with that option. You don't actually have to turn anything in for changing the font. I just wanted to show you how to do it so that you were aware of that process. Uh, part three is word art. Um, this is kind of a collage about you. If you do a Google image search, for word art, you get lots of examples. I'm not expecting you to do Steph Curry, for example. Okay, So it doesn't have to be this kind of a profile. It doesn't have to be a picture. It can be just something like this. Essentially, a, a combination of descriptions about you that you're going to put together. This is kind of the big thing that you're doing today. Uh, in the rest of your lab time. Because the Vitruvius thing you basically did while I did it with you. Okay, So this is a big thing I'm looking for today. Uh, it doesn't have to be any kind of a set, uh, you know, in any kind of a particular shape. I just want it to be about you and who you are. Does that make sense? And if you need ideas, you can, you can go through and look up word art and you can see lots of these um, kinds of examples. Okay, So that's what you're doing under part three. You'll export your work. Make sure you save the InDesign file. Uh, you'll e export your work to a JPEG, and you'll post it by the end of class today. Are there any questions? Not yet. OK, I'll turn you loose. <laughs>